And so I wrote down in preparation for this, folks, I wanted to I wanted to get down and dirty and ask Chad all sorts of questions about Best Buy. Um, yeah. And I wrote down a bunch of questions because you were a director. So yeah. I, maybe yeah. even before we get into some of these juicy questions, like I remember you were a GM. Um, what is a director? Like, talk to me about like, what you were doing there and at what level you said you were in the corporate village in the corporate building yeah. too. And like, help us understand what that was. Yeah. It's a lot of different roles, you know, uh, the, the hierarchy of traditional, uh, business, um, Best Buy had a job grade for everything. So you could be a director of anything, but be a director, but you might have a job grade of a nine or a 10 or an 11 or a 12. And so it, uh, it, that's a good question. Cause it means a lot of different things for me. I was always passionate about the field, right? That's where sales happened. That's where the technology was. That's where things moved fast. And so um, I was always a director field facing. The uniqueness was there was three or four of us uh, that loved the field that also were able to office out of uh, the corporate office. And so um, whether we were locally running stores or for me, it mostly, most of my career was outside of Minnesota. and. Um, to office out of there and be this liaison to the corporate office. Um, we were this little small group of ours. We were the insight to the field and, and, uh, and it was one of the most impactful things. And so throughout my career, that director has meant a few things, a district manager of big boxes, um, overseeing roughly three quarters of a billion dollars in, in big boxes in various geographies. Uh, it meant a direct national director of our uh, specialty stores. So ran uh, Indiana to California, and I mentioned that, um, uh, but smaller stores. So two, three, 400, um, you know, with a similar whatever, half a billion dollar uh, portfolio. Um, and, uh, and so director has meant a few different things, uh, but it's essentially, you know, from that GM role, I went into these district roles, and then from there, uh, certain roles you know that faces the field uh, are director level. And so the uniqueness was, you know, uh, for two years of my time in running the the, the most of the country uh, in Best Buy Mobile, my wall backed up against uh, Uber Jolie, the CEO, the turnaround specialist of Best Buy, and so you know that. Those are those are really fun days because you know the very first Monday that I came in and rode the elevator with him up and we're walking down the hallway and he realized like we're on the same floor. He's brand new. I was gonna do his Geek Squad integration coming into Best Buy, which you know more on that. But uh, he says, "Chad, you know Frenchman. I can't I can't do his accent, but <laughs> how was business?" And I just go off on. It was great. We had a great weekend. Um, the mobile business was awesome. All of this. Next day, we get on the elevator, and Uber says, "Chad, you lied to me." He said, "Business was not good." <laughs> I'm like, "No, business was good." He goes, "Chad, I am the CEO of Best Buy." <laughs> when I ask how business is good, not how Chad McDermott's business is good, how was Best Buy's business? And just lessons like that, you know, of this uniqueness of then. Of course, yes, and there's light bulb moments like that from incredible executives, incredible leaders throughout my career who grabbed me by the arm and, and taught me things like, look beyond yourself and, and what, how are you defining things like success? Because he wasn't, he wasn't scolding me. He knew how the business was. He was just, he knew what he was doing and I love him to death. And, uh, um, and so that's that uniqueness of gleaning the wisdom from the executive team and the C-suite uh, at the office, but then also being that liaison to say, hey, this landed poorly in the fields. This is what customers are saying. And that was kind of that director level um, field and corporate uh, up until up until everybody went home uh, <laughs> in the business. So, yeah. So everyone went home in the business. You're talking like COVID times yeah, type of deal. Yeah, that's interesting. It anymore, but yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I hate those words. It's funny. So, you know, I started at Best Buy in 2004, and I think some of the basic fundamentals that I learned there were, you know, they taught contact, you know, care plus yep. when you're in sales that you would contact someone, you'd ask questions, lifestyle questions about what they're looking for. You'd recommend a solution and, and then you'd encourage the sale and you'd kind of do that in your own special way. And, and, uh, it was funny when, when I started, I went to the 
I think it's the second or fourth oldest Best Buy. It's this Best Buy Burnsville. Yep, um, yep. Store number eight, store number which, eight. which we, call we call the Ocho. The Ocho. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when I first got there, 2004, a lot of people might not know this in technology. There's big changes. I remember that laptops had kind of started at this 3,000 you know, 4,000, 3,000, 2,500. Yep. And back then that's a lot of money and they started to move down. And then I also remember at this period of time is when we opened a bunch of stores around us. Like I got hired at, at Best Buy the Ocho and yep. Lakeville, Shaka, like they opened like four stores around us. And then, right. um, so there's some really strange things going on. When I first started mail-in rebates, you'd go buy a computer package for $2,000. Right. Right. There'd be $500 worth the doggone mail-in rebates. Like if you stack these up and throw in a garlic cove and mail it in on a Wednesday, maybe we'll give you $500 back. And there's all, like I saw so much evolution through those businesses, right. but some of the basic things that I remember that I look fondly back, um, that that sales tool of Care Plus was kind of this rudimentary thing that yeah. people kind of, you know, would, would kind of harp on and criticize later on. And, you know, it's not perfect, but it is funny how, yeah, you go out and like, it's at least a system that you can count on your hands and dumb monkeys like me can go out and do it. Like, okay. Um, right. yeah. That was a big thing for me. And then, um, and I just bring this up because I think that one of the, I have so many questions here, so I don't even want to sidetrack too much. I'm not sure what was, Good. what you were most excited to talk about. Cause you going um, on, I like it. Well, I think, you know, that that simple thing. And then it was also where I learned value. So I had been listening to lots of John Maxwell. Um, my dad was really pouring into me, getting lots of leadership stuff. I know we kind of laughed about you're the one that's like, John Maxwell just he kind of makes his own stuff up. I'm like, yeah, but it's good stuff, Chad. Yeah, good stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and and I remember that, you know, yeah. talking about values of, of who you are as you do things. But I, I, I can't even remember all of them, but it was like learn from challenge and change. Have fun while being the best. Sell Unleash a lot of warranties. Of oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yep. Step three first. Um, but I, you know, one of the things that I learned at Best Buy. So I'm, I'm bringing this up because I learned a lot of good fundamentals, but they really did empower their people. I felt like yeah. I felt like when I got there, they stuck a ten on my forehead and said, "We can teach you to become anything. Like you're going to be em truly empowered." Um, and one of the questions I had said, you know, one of the things that I learned was all the, they shared a lot of financial information with mm. their line level employees. Yeah. Um, you saw, I bet from end to end, I, I'm sure that kind of waned as we go, yeah. but, um, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, so when I was there every hour, a sales manager would come by and yep. tell us, Hey, here was our daily projection in revenue. Here was our daily percentage of, of, of uh, margin we were supposed to have. And then we yep. knew like how many accessory percentage sh points should we have and how much should be software and how many warranties and how many this and that all like we really yeah. knew the bit and I'm just some dude, some like yeah. 20 year old kid, um, Perkins server. <laughs> a Perkins server learning about all these things. And, right. um, you know, what, what were, as you look back at that, what are the good parts of that? What are the things that like, what perspective do you have oh, yeah. um, as, as we talk about that? I love it. So first and foremost, I'm a numbers guy. And so I, I ate that up, right? Like that was like, uh, we talked about bleeding blue, right? The best buy blue. And, and uh, I remember put buying, uh, you probably remember this, a whiteboard on rollers and putting it in front every morning doing a chalk talk. And we're, we're math matting, we're mapping out our uh, close rates and our average sale price and our baskets. And we're running around the store grabbing, hey, we only sold two accessories per computer. Go get seven and show us how you would ask the questions to get there. And like, I remember, I remember all that. And that's the value. Um, that's the value. There is so much good. I think it does, it did three things um, that I still strive to replicate. Number one, it created a spirit of transparency. Nobody was hiding anything. Nobody was hiding anything. And that, you know, there's a line, right, maybe. Um, but I run it, ran into this in small business consulting and medium business and in both of these service companies is like wh where the owners or where the leaders want to draw the lines on transparency of what are they making, how are they making their money, um, and everything in between. But there's the spirit of transparency that said, I'm working for a company that trusts me with information that would 
you know, it wasn't big enough to be considered insider trading, but if that store was being traded, it would be. Um, and that's a, that's a really um, galvanizing principle. And there's ways to do that well beyond, you know, just sharing all your financials. But um, the second thing that I think that it did um, was it, it created a reward system, right? Because Best Buy wasn't, it's not really based on, even less so today, but even then, it's non-commission. That was part of Dick Schultz's plan after the great tornado sale in Roseville was like, we can do this and not do commission and do what's right for our customer. Now, you could argue both ways, right? Commission, my livelihood depends on me doing what's right. Non-commission, I'm not gonna sell you something that you don't need. You can, what a good salesperson could sell either yeah. way, right? But, Nothing keeps you more yeah. honest than chargebacks. Chargebacks right. will keep you honest real quick. That's right. That's right. Um, but that was a part of the fabric was this idea that we're not commissioned. So everything we were doing was on this foundation of for the customer. And that was really, I mean, that was one of my favorite parts. All of these numbers, like close rates, they, we, would, we would provide the information or get provided the information that nine out of 10 people that walked into our doors intended to buy. They would hire third party, you know, surveyors that stood out on your curbs on hot days and gave people gift cards to answer the questions to hold us accountable to, it does close rate matter? Because if we had a 48% close rate, but 90% of people intended on buying something, then we messed up something in the store. Mm -hmm. And it was always for the customer. And it just always underlined, it's not just add more accessories, it's when that customer gets home, because that was before the online revolution and Amazon mm -hmm. revolution. When that customer gets home, they're gonna be ticked mm -hmm. that you didn't sell them a USB cable because now mm -hmm. it's going to be a second trip. Uh, and that's how we taught it. And I think that was incredible. Um, and then the third thing, it gave, gave a rallying point. It gave a rallying point because, and this is, this is huge for me and my leadership. One of my passions has become leading people away from defining themselves by outcomes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what I mean, like I get it, close rates and outcome, average sale price, outcome, basket outcome, but, but you could have a bad day as a store and celebrate the behaviors because you closed 80% mm -hmm. or because you had great baskets or because whatever the, it doesn't matter the business. Now we're talking way beyond sales, but in that time for Best Buy, in that transparency, um, you have those three things. You create you know, this transparency and this underlying customer uh, center of everything. And then you had this ability to celebrate this team that was on the sales floor that last hour closed every customer with something. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that goes so far in helping anyone understand that you are not defined by, your, by the outcomes you produce, uh, but by the behaviors that you uh, live out. And, uh, and those three things were incredible. Now, <clears throat> it all went away. Uh, mm. I remember the very first P&L at a store level that was the new P&L because they didn't want, I was a GM, six year GM. And we were of course given the message, right? Like we're gonna help you focus on your store and we don't want you chasing vendor support or going and chasing this $50 you know, security bill that shouldn't have been paid or doing the things that are corporate. And so we're gonna take those off your P&L. Uh, and so we got it. It changed from net operating profit to operating income, which was, you know, mm. maybe forty percent of the PL and all of a sudden it was like, hmm, there's no impact anymore. You are being defined by sales and margins because everything else was being called not not controllable by you. And so you started to lose some of that luster and that was um that was early on. And so that that shift started um and and it certainly uh, as, as people saw less and less of what they were producing created this opposite effect of transparency, Interesting. the opposite effect of can we impact what happens on a day to day and, and, uh, and in Rob, in the absence of a narrative, people will write their own narrative. And then the narrative started about, you know, the vendor support and the behind the scenes money and what stores getting credit for selling this what were the computers back then? Compaq and Gateway. Yeah, yeah the Compaqs, yeah. 
that that's that's fascinating you know for anyone that's listening to this i don't think average people understand how much coaching and leadership development and you know management taught share with people like what did the leadership structure of a store look like and what you know i think you did it really well i had leaders that didn't do it as well but you know <laughs> what would a rhythm of a day and an hour kind of look like in these yeah. layers because that's one thing i noticed at best buy is like they wanted to unleash the power of their people <laughs> truly and that kind of meant there was different there, there was ways for you to step up and yeah. and and yeah. really it was always leadership focused but help people yeah. understand what that might look like and then how in-depth were the numbers i mean i thought it was yeah. fascinating from my perspective yeah that's great that's a great question and you know, Rob, you you and I, when I was a GM and when you were at Best Buy, we got to live that empowering of the people, right? The, the value was unleash the power of the people. There was a period then of multiple years where that died, and that's an interesting uh, tie to the fall, right? So you just watch the stock price. Might have been 40, 50, 60 when we were there, went down to nine something. Um, and then Uber Jolie comes back in as the turnaround specialist for Best Buy, widely regarded as one of the greatest CEOs in, in the history of US business now. Um, and it was one of the key things he brought back. He wrote a whole book about it, the heart of business and it was unleashing the human magic. Um, and so there's these two seasons in Best Buy where one is focused, truly focused on unleash the power of your people, and the other is focused on um, the human magic at the heart of business. And those are the two most successful seasons of Best Buy. Um, and in fact, probably the only successful seasons, is, you know, depending on how you look at today. Um, and so very, very different in the approach and, uh, and the hierarchy. Um, <laughs> stores were very deep. In, in, in hierarchy. And that, that is an interesting um, interesting point that I think as business has evolved today, flatter organizations are more agile, nimble, and you know able to impact behaviors. But for then, um, you would have an entire district team supporting the general manager. Um, you would have a district manager, and then you'd have a district team over every discipline. And back then, Rob, Boy, let's see, when I was running those stores, we had an operations manager, a sales manager, uh, a inventory manager, um, at one point a product process manager, a customer experience manager. You might have a specialty manager if you had Best Buy for Business, uh, segment manager, uh, and, and, and then they each had supervisors. So the sales manager had a CD and DVD supervisor and a computing supervisor and which was what you were for a lot of that time um, and a home theater supervisor and a car audio supervisor and so yeah. you have this giant leadership structure uh, an incredible investment um, and so the commitment in those days was every single person in a store getting a one-on-one -on -one every week or two uh and that was pretty incredible investment and and that included gm to the managers managers to the supervisor supervisors to the full-time and part-time employees uh, you could be a part-time employee engaged in leadership like invested leadership training and coaching at that point in time and uh in the time we just it always was made because as this supervisor was having a one-on-one -on -one, this one covered the floor or this employee was out of computing this person from home theater got cross-trained and and uh and it was pretty incredible just that the the acumen that you talked about at the mm -hmm. beginning is what mm -hmm. lays the foundation of the simplicity for a sales system so you talked about care plus that's one of many but i think any good sales system is going to be simple and memorable um you know it's sustainable and can be replicated that's it and and so it doesn't matter at that point in time you were selling computers well if home theater called in sick or was on their one-on-one -on -one, guess what it's the same process yeah contact yeah. Ask questions recommend a product encourage them to buy it and then add a little bit of yourself to the interaction and so um so much one-on-one -on -one and investment to go back to your original question.